in the 1960s, uh, the CIA, using them as, as sort of the, the real planning uh, group, had within their group a program they called the ZR Rifle Program. That was the cryptonym for their assassination apparatus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Out of this ZR Rifle Program, the, the cryptonym for its principal agent was QJ Wynn. QJ Wynn? QJ Wynn. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, of course, this ZR Rifle Program began to be used with respect to Cuba in uh, 1961. And in doing so, that's when they first became involved in, with organized crime. Uh, this QJ Wynn plays an important r role in the release on uh, very shortly after the assassination of a, of a man by the name of Tom Davis. Released? What do you released mean? from custody of the, of the police over in Algeria. Oh. He was arrested in uh, as, uh, gun running activities. He was released with the, on, the, on the behest or with the help of QJ Wynn. What makes this intriguing is that Tom Davis told a well-respected reporter in Dallas that he was using the name of Oswald and uh, in his gun running activities to the Cuban exiles, that he was connected to the Cuban exiles, but that he was running these guns with a man by the name of Jack Ruby, who was the killer of Lee Harvey Oswald, which, as we now know, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the Jack Ruby connects to organized crime directly. What Mr. Merritt did best, among other things, was smuggle heroin into the United States. He was a, a killer. He became a member of the French Secret Service, and that's uh, uh, the equivalent of our CIA, STEC. Mm -hmm. And uh, in his connections with that organization, uh, began a drug operation into this country. He, in my opinion, is a, is a good suspect for the director of the uh, assassination and he, could possibly be Q.J. Wynn, who was a European. The second in our two-part series on an update on the Kennedy assassination with the author of Cover Up. We'll provide recent information uncovered by the Freedom of Information Act by interviews with various people and congressional sources, right now. We're back again with Gary Shaw, author of Cover Up, an architect in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Cover Up is one of those books, an incredible book, which tells the truth about the Kennedy assassination. Our last program, we went into great detail to show that it was impossible for one person, Lee Harvey Oswell or anybody, to have killed John F. Kennedy because there were more than one shot fired. Well. On our program this week, we're going to do some speculation about what this means for the country. We're going to talk about some of the new evidence that has come up since the last program we did with, uh, with Gary back in 1979, and uh, some surprise uh, connections with us, too. Uh, what has happened since 79? There have been congressional investigations, and your investigations have been going on. What are some of the highlights? Well, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, of course, came out with their conclusion that there was a probable conspiracy, which was a real winner 
for us. <laughs> we had fought long and hard for that and had uh, actually assisted that committee in, uh, in every way that we could to see that they reached that conclusion. Unfortunately, they didn't go far enough. They did say that the Justice Department should pursue several areas, uh, which they have not done even to this date. Uh, the chief counsel for that committee said that uh, it was a historical fact as far as he was concerned. The mob killed John Kennedy. Now, I don't know as I totally agree. I agree that the mob was heavily involved and, and probably paid a big portion of the money and used their personnel to do it. Uh, but there were others, I think, in, involved in it. They didn't but say anything about the FBI the, or the CIA. They said that uh, the Warren Commission as a whole and the investigative bodies that was used by the Warren Commission all was flawed. Mm -hmm. So there was a real put down by this new committee of the original Warren Commission and its report and its findings and conclusions. And so that was important to us. If we're going to get the truth out to the American people, that was a big step or a big hurdle. Unfortunately, the major news media said ho-hum to it, and therefore the majority of the American people don't even know that, even though they still believe today that uh, at least about 85 to 90 percent of the American people believe that Oswald did not act alone. They've, they've never been given any evidence on prime time national television to show them why they believe that, and there's plenty as you've seen last week, and, and we'll talk about this week. Yeah. Gary, let's uh, start up, off with this concept of the cover-up. This was the title of your book. Who did the cover-up of the Kennedy assassination and why? You've indicated that the Warren Commission report was part of this, but who would want to cover up the truth about the Kennedy assassination? Boy, I asked that question many times, because when you start asking that, you, you start looking at men like Earl Warren, and uh, Alan Dulles and Gerald Ford and, and J. Edgar Hoover and, and Richard Helms, who was director of the, of the Central Intelligence Agency at that time. And you just go on and on. And it's mind-boggling to know that, uh, hey, there was something amiss here, that, that there was a cover-up, and did these men do it? And um, I don't even try to answer that question any longer. All I can say, mm -hmm. without a shadow of a doubt, is that there was a cover-up. And we can point to it specifically in, in particular instances that changed the real meaning of the president's death. And uh, I'm not going to sit here and say President Johnson did it and caused it to be done. I don't think we can do that. I think you've got to come back around and find out who did it you know, get somebody who we know covered up or altered testimony and say, why did you alter this testimony? Why did you do this? Who told you to do it? Who was your superior that caused this to happen? And then go right on up the ladder. And I think eventually we'd get to the truth. The incredible the part about it to me is not only these various government agencies were involved in the cover up, but also the regular mass media life magazine, the networks, and even as late as, when was that Dan Rather cover-up thing about, uh, what, about 10 years ago? About 10 years ago, uh-huh. Where they came out and they looked at all the evidence, we're going to make sure we do everything right, and they came to the conclusion that Oswald was the lone assassin. And now recently, when Walter Cronkite was wanting to do a complete investigation and documentary on the Kennedy assassination, CBS turned him down. Uh -huh. Even Uncle Walter. Yes, but you remember sure. that Uncle Walter was the one that was interviewing Lyndon Johnson when Lyndon Johnson made the comment that we were running a, quote, a damned murder incorporated in the Caribbean in the early 1960s. Do you remember that? And yeah. CBS cut that completely out. And it was years before we knew what was cut out. We just knew that something was cut. Mm. And... Uh, so the, the media did participate in the cover-up. Now, C.D. Jackson is a long-time uh, OSS and CIA He's head of man. Time Life. Yes, uh, he, was, he was the head of Time Life at that and time. And a very big person in the total American power structure. That's He's right. He's a big person in the organizations like the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers, the Council of Foreign, Foreign he, uh, Unfortunately, he died soon 
after that. Uh -huh. He he was the one responsible for buying the Subruder film, printing a few frames of it in Life magazine, and then locking it up because he didn't think the American people ought to see it. I take the opposite view. If, if the American people had seen that film on Friday night, November the 22nd, 1963, they'd have never bought the lone assassin single bullet theory. Well, let's take a look at that remarkable and revealing film right now. This is the famous Abraham Zapruder film of the Kennedy assassination. The president is now hit in the back, and then while he's behind the sign, he's hit in the throat from the front. He's now grasping at his throat and trying to talk to his wife. And the fatal head shot. This is a blow up of that head shot. The president is hit, now he's trying to talk to his wife, and he receives the fatal headshot. The president's reaction to the headshot can be seen more clearly with these enlargements. Notice that as the president is struck by the fatal headshot, his body is driven violently backwards. Let's uh, indeed go into some of these theories of who actually did the Kennedy assassination, beginning with your theory at the end of uh, Cover Up, your uh, book that was published on the Kennedy assassination. You ran through all the possible suspects and then reached some conclusions as to what might have happened. Do you want to recap that for us and then we can take off from that? Okay, what I did in 1976, and I've changed a little since then, and of course I think a person that doesn't change as new evidence comes to light is, you know, you better change. Uh, but I looked at three things. Any crime, my motive means an opportunity. Um, John Kennedy, without a doubt, had managed to alienate every, every major force in the country, whether it be the right wing or, or the military or the CIA, uh, organized crime. His brother Bobby was going after organized crime like no one had ever done before. And everybody, it seemed like, or every special interest group, he had managed to alienate. So there were a lot of people, the, the all people here in Texas, the extreme right wing here in Texas, hated him. The Cubans because the Cuban of exiles, the Bay of Pigs fiasco. Right, because of that. And so uh, he had enemies. So there was a lot of motive to his death. Uh, each one of these groups had the means, you know, uh, and each one of them had the opportunity. Well, they also said, Bobby Kennedy, uh, they were s saying that they were thinking about shutting down the CIA because of the bad information uh, that they received and the bad guidance right. uh, concerning the well, he, it, Bay of Pigs. So that's another connection. Robert and, and uh, John both alienated the, the military leaders because they wanted to go blow Cuba off the face of the earth when the missile crisis was mm -hmm. going on. And uh, so they had a lot of enemies. And each one of them had motive, means, and opportunity. Yeah, you understand? But the big thing that I pointed out in 1976 is not all of those groups had the ability or the power to cover up the true facts surrounding the assassination. And so that's what I tried to look at. And I said in 1976 that to cover up the facts surrounding the assassination was proper suspicion of guilt. And so I pointed a strong finger after examining the motives and the means of, of all of these groups, I pointed a strong f finger and, and uh, I think, you know, still could toward the military industrial intelligence complex that, that had evolved and, and that President Eisenhower had warned about before he left office. And uh, I've changed somewhat since then just simply because some of the things that we know now has, has caused me to change. That, to me, would involve too many people. Too many people that I think are honorable people. Uh, not everybody in the CIA is a bad guy. Not everybody in the FBI is bad. Most of them are, are American citizens of, of uh, good mind and, and good quality and good moral values and, and, and so forth. So I had to look at it as the years went by from, a, from another standpoint because the people kept asking me, boy, that's a huge conspiracy. Somebody's going to crack and, and talk. So 
I finally came uh, around to, as we learned about the strange marriage between uh, the um, executive branch and organized crime through a mistress, through assassination apparatus pointed toward Fidel Castro in Cuba that was okayed by the Kennedys. Operated uh, by the CIA. Operated by the CIA and using Cuban exiles because they wanted to get Cuba back for many reasons. Cuba, the organized crime wanted it back because as they're Las Vegas off the coast of Florida, you know, that's a money making, you know, that, that was their drug uh, jumping off place into the United States. And uh, America, the United States, wanted Cuba. They didn't want uh, Reds, you know, <laughs> right there 90 miles off their coast. And uh, so there was a strange marriage between this CIA personnel who were training the Cuban exiles. And by the way, they trained them well in sabotage, assassination, and smuggling. <laughs> the Cubans are still using that, yeah. even today, you know. And uh, so you, you have that marriage that uh, if, and this is purely speculation, but I don't mind speculation if it's good speculation, let's just take a scenario that they put together an assassination team to go after Castro. Well, we know they did. This has been we well documented. We know they documented. did, yeah. and, and they failed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, our government says that they failed eight times. Mr. Castro says about 24 times. Uh, probably somewhere in between that's the truth, but probably closer to Mr. Castro's estimate. But if, let's say, they turn these same assassins, or say they turn, for whatever reason, more money, uh, uh, because they uh, hated what Mr. Kennedy was doing, they, uh, if they were Cuban exiles or partially Cuban exiles, they hated it because Kennedy had now turned his back on his promise of a free Cuba. Uh, organized crime had felt betrayed because here they were working together and now suddenly they're not. You don't do the mafia that way. You know, you jump in bed with them and you go along with them and everything's fine, but if you cross them, uh, they'll write you a letter. <laughs> and uh, it, it kind of blows up. It kind of blows up. <laughs> and uh, let's say that the same group ended up shooting the President of the United States in Dallas. In fact, on the day that it happened, Robert Kennedy picked up the phone and called one of the Cuban exiles and said, one of your guys killed the president. Hmm. What? what? I've what never heard, heard that. You've never yeah, heard what, that. Uh, okay. what, what did he, uh... This was in the Washington Post, and this came out just about oh, probably five or six years ago. Okay. So here's Bobby Kennedy saying, you know, what I have a tendency to believe happened, that there was some Cuban exiles involved, and in they were trained in assassination. Why not use them? And uh, they wanted revenge because hmm. their brothers their friends, their their compatriots in the, in the invasion of, at the Bay of Pigs were slaughtered. They think Taken Kennedy sabotaged the Bay of Pigs, that the Eisenhower administration had promised these Cuban exiles that uh, the United States would invade Cuba or would at least organize an invasion of Cubans to overthrow Castro. Right. And Kennedy was unenthusiastic about it and didn't give them what they consider adequate support. So they were outraged. They were outraged. They, and the one thing that he did is that they were promised an umbrella of air support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't invade right. uh, without that air support. And that's what Kennedy called off right at the last minute and left them vulnerable at the invasion and allowed them to be slaughtered. That was the key word with the Cuban exiles, by the way, and uh, we may talk about this if you if you want to. And that's this umbrella of air support. Uh, every time they would turn, they would talk about the invasion of the Bay of Pigs. They would talk about we're going to have an umbrella of air support that will carry us in and and uh, and make ready for this invasion. Of course, there were a lot of flaws in the CIA. The CIA estimated that the uh, the people would uprise against Castro and there'd be easy pickings, but as we know, this didn't happen. So well, it even, didn't. even without the, even if they had had the uh, air umbrella, it'd still been highly questionable whether they'd been That's able right. to Well, the, the key was, off. though, mm -hmm. is that That's if they right. could make the invasion work mm -hmm. and get into the mountains, just like Castro did, mm -hmm. then that's when the people 
would uh, they would begin to sway people to come in their directions and they never got with that they were never able to get that little guerrilla group like Castro had so we don't know whether it would have worked or not right but they of course thought that it yeah. would yes well there was also a, a, another very important situation regarding Cuba and Kennedy and that is as I understand that Kennedy was having secret indirect talks through the Swiss embassy or somebody with Castro to French try to embassy. French embassy uh -huh. to try to normalize relations with with Castro and of uh -huh. course the CIA would have known about this and so this they would have fed this to their buddies and uh, uh -huh. well there have been some very strange things that have happened that have popped up uh, um, in the past uh, oh, eight years like you were showing me some guy can actually confess to being part of the assassination team that's something we, we could down in San Antonio. We could Tell find out that. right here in Texas. Uh, most most of your viewers will be familiar with the John Judge John Wood case in San Antonio, a federal judge who was assassinated uh, in 1979, and that a man named, by the name of Charles Harrelson was arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison for that assassination, and that's what it was. But what most people don't know is that when he was arrested, Mr. Harrelson actually confessed, and this is a, a March 20th, 1981 Dallas Morning News article. Several officers heard the confession of Charles Harrelson as he confessed to killing President John Kennedy. And this is in just in about two just or three little two sentences three buried in the bottom, in the middle of the uh, report. Right. And they never even they never it. got national no, uh, coverage never. of a major. Never. So was he involved with organized crime? Did this guy have Yes, a and history? of course we we're always interested. In fact, we were interested in him as soon as he killed John Wood, simply because of his appearance. Mm -hmm. Because actually, on the day of the assassination, three men were taken into custody, mm -hmm. hiding over beyond the grassy knoll in a box car, open box car. They were paraded across. Elm Street in front of the school book depository and about six photographs were taken of them. These and are the they, famous three tramps. The famous three tramps and yeah. taken into the sheriff's headquarters. Nothing was ever said about them. There is no record of their arrest. So we don't no know names. who they are. We, we don't, don't have any pictures. Never. We've got pictures, but we never knew who they were. Okay. And the okay. pictures is what. And the pictures are what are what's fascinating. Okay. Because these would be bad bad photographs, but here is a picture of, of one of the tramps along with the uh, mugshot of Charles Harrelson. You can see the strong facial resemblance here. Here's another photograph at a different angle of the, of the tall, uh, tallest of the three tramps and also a different view of a photograph of Charles Harrelson. And we've got that. Oh, they look uh, so much, when so you, when much you alike. See, yeah, when you see them up Here's the third real. view, the same tramp, the same tall tramp, but a, a different view of Charles Harrelson. Not only do the photographs look alike, not only has he confessed, but he also was connected to all the right people. He, was, he was a friend of the, of the best friend of Jack Ruby, knew Jack Ruby. Uh, he... Uh, was familiar with Dallas and organized all the organized crime figures in Dallas. He uh, also was involved with gun running during the Bay of Pigs, so he was familiar with uh, Cuban exiles and some of the CIA personnel. He had uh, connections. He had all with the, CIA. the right connections. Mm -hmm. And uh, these photographs, as bad as they were, were shown to some um, forensic. Um, pathologist who study facial features okay and testify in courtrooms about whether this photograph if it's aged 10 years uh, would look like this photograph and uh, their findings on three of these these photographs were that there was a 90 to 95 percent probability that Charles Harrelson 
and this tallest of the three tramps were one and the same. So this would give credence to his confession. Very, very much so. Let's go back for just a minute to this organized crime connection. You pointed out that organized crime was very angry uh, because uh, they lost Cuba. They had big uh, prostitution, gambling, all kinds of drug organizations that were operating in Cuba. After the Cuban Revolution, of course, they were put out of business. So they would be in favor of the overthrow of Castro. Correct. And therefore, would be angry at the failure of the Bay of Pigs. Plus, Robert Kennedy, as Attorney General, went after organized crime. And they thought they had an understanding with the Kennedys that they would leave the Kennedys alone and cooperate in certain ways if the Kennedys didn't come after them and Bobby Kennedy came after them. So they would think that they were betrayed and in terms of their primitive ethic that therefore they could <laughs> get revenge. Well, there's evidence that uh that organized crime got them the Illinois vote. You know how important the mm -hmm. Illinois Stealing vote. the uh, election through the daily machine in Chicago. That's right. And uh, so uh, we also know that Sam Giancana was out of Chicago and uh, he had a mistress. Most of some of your viewers probably are familiar with uh, that came out just this, this year that a lady by the name of Judith Exner was a mistress of Sam Giancana, head of the Chicago right. Mafia and also head of uh, this assassination attempts on Fidel Castro organized by our CIA and that Jack Kennedy had a relationship with this same Judith Exner and she tested or that she mean they were lovers recently. or something? Yes, they were lovers. She was a mistress. A mistress, uh-huh. And that she actually became a courier between the President of the United States and Sam Giancana during the period that she was seeing him in and out of the White House. Hmm. There's another mistress involved here. I saw in a Liberty Lobby uh, or a, a Spotlight article uh, a few years ago where there was an investigation or something, maybe you read about that uh, too, about Marita Lorenz who had been uh, one of the favorites of Fidel Castro and she had testified in court that she had participated in a two-car caravan uh, a couple days before the assassination that went to Dallas this caravan had rifles, had firearms. One of the people, one of the passengers was Lee Harvey Oswald. And when they got to Dallas, they were paid off by E. Howard Hunt, who also took the arms. Now, is this verifiable, or, or is it anything you've heard about? I've heard about it and read about it, and, and there's no way you can verify something like this except to say that uh, E. Howard Hunt goes way, way back to the origin of the Bay of Pigs under Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon is the one that uh, originally started this uh, movement to invade Cuba using the Cuban exiles and using e. Howard Hunt and Bernard Barker and, and uh, uh, Virgilio Gonzalez and all of these, or Mar Martinez, and all of these people that later end up, James McCart, end up as the Watergate burglars and yeah. the Nixon administration. Two of the people in this caravan with her were also so turned up. Everywhere you look, you see, you, again, you see Howard Hunt. In fact, when um, Charles Bremer, Arthur Bremer, uh, shot uh, George, Wallace. George Wallace, the the first person ordered to Bremer's apartment was E. Howard Hunt. Okay. So well, there, there's another major uh, hypothesis here that um, Part of the theory of some people was that uh, after the Kennedy assassination, it would be blamed on Fidel Castro, that Oswald was a member of this Fair Play for Cuba committee, or at least there were uh, pictures of him associated with this uh, group, plus his connections with the Soviet Union that you outlined in the first uh, program, that he had defected to the Soviet Union, that he'd married the daughter of an intelligence uh, agent, etc. So they were building, therefore, a scenario where they could blame it on Fidel Castro, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, and could use that as a pretext for the invasion of Cuba, which would, of course, satisfy both the mob plus these right-wing Cubans and other right-wing groups in the uh, United States. So this is also part of at least a scenario as to what was going on at I that think, time. I think a very p important part of the scenario that was going on. They, they wanted the patsy. They wanted the, mm -hmm. the finger pointed to... Uh, to Fidel Castro so that there would be an uprising against it. 
Let's show the people your conception of the organizational structure of the CIA and the mafia and the relationships and how this was set up. In the 1960s, uh, the CIA, using them as, as sort of the, the real planning uh, group, had within their group a program they called the ZR Rifle Program. That was the cryptonym for their assassination apparatus. Mm -hmm. Okay, out of this ZR rifle program, the the cryptonym for its principal agent was Q J Win. Q J Win. Q J Win. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, of course this ZR rifle program began to be used with respect to Cuba in uh, 1961, and in doing so, that's when they first became involved in, with organized crime. This Sam Gincana, Johnny Roselli, mm -hmm. both who died strange and untimely deaths before they could give testimony to a Senate uh, committee. And uh, this organized crime group also were utilizing the Cuban exiles and also out of this ZR rifle program, the, the, the man chiefly responsible uh, for it was a man by the name of William Harvey. He was the coordinator for the, for the CIA? For the CR rifle program mm -hmm. through the CIA. Mm -hmm. Okay. And their first project was to kill Fidel Castro. That was I don't a, know that that was that was first a major person, project. But that was a major project, And that would obviously. involve both these Cuban exiles who would presumably help do it, plus organized crime that had its connections in Cuba as well as its professionals mm -hmm. to do something like that. That's or was correct. this just the umbrella, use that term again, the umbrella organization of the CIA for world White assassinations. Cause well, that's obviously that okay. because this this was not right. just localized to Cuba, but it was mm -hmm. made applicable according to a document made applicable to Cuba in 1961, okay. which meant that they were going after Fidel, Fidel Castro. What uh, one of the the strange coincidence, and I don't call it a coincidence, except in a uh, somewhat of a jocular manner, because I'm up to my eyeballs in coincidences in this case. <laughs> Uh, this Q.J. Wynn plays an important r role in the release on uh, very shortly after the assassination of a, of a man by the name of Tom Davis. Released? What do you released mean? from custody of the, of the police over in Algeria. Oh. He was arrested in uh, as, uh, gun running activities. You remember they were having big warfare in and around Algeria uh, in, in those years. And uh, so he was released with the, on, the, on the behest or with the help of Q.J. Wynn. What makes this intriguing is that Tom Davis told a well-respected reporter in Dallas that he was using the name of Oswald and uh, in his gun-running activities to the Cuban exiles, that he was connected to the Cuban exiles, but that he was running these guns with a man by the name of Jack Ruby who was the killer of Lee Harvey Oswald, which, as we now know, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the Jack Ruby connects to organized crime directly. So you, you see we've come pretty well full circle uh, with, these, with these connections. And Jack Ruby's, before his trial for the murder of Lee Harvey Oswald, he, his attorney asked him if there was anything he didn't want brought out in this trial. And the one thing that he told his attorney not to, not to, he'd get anywhere close to, was Tommy Davis. Let's go into oh. this for a little bit because this is the hypothesis of the other Oswald. This is the book by uh, Richard Popkin, who's a Kennedy assassination uh, expert. The thesis here is that Oswald alone couldn't have done the assassination because there was more than one uh, rifle. We didn't mention in the first program that the rifle that Oswald used was a quite inferior one. It's unlikely that it could perform such a precision feat of killing the president from the distance in which he was placed in relation to the um, motorcade. Plus, there's all these other uh, stories about Oswald that would indicate that he is an unlikely candidate for the uh, lone assassin. And in particular, a lot of pictures of him appeared 
in different places, holding guns, making uh, threats against uh, the president, so that it's possible that someone was masquerading as Oswald to call attention to him to set him up as a patsy. Mm -hmm. And so now you're saying we have a, a possibility for the other uh, Oswald, the other which Oswald. is uh, Tom uh, Davis, all of which would entail a rather large conspiracy that a lot of individuals were involved in carefully planning this operation, which would require the sort of apparatus that someone like the CIA or organized crime or a very well-financed and well-organized group would have at their disposal. Would have at their disposal, I think very definitely. Okay. Now, Oswald, or quote Oswald, unquote, was also seen in Mexico City, too. Uh, in a Soviet embassy. Yeah, right? in a Soviet embassy. Part of this business to blame it on the commies. Now, did this uh, Davis look like Oswald in yeah, actuality? He, he had the same build. The only photographs that I have of him, there's no real strong facial resemblance. But he could comb his hair slightly different, color it, uh, and, he, and his physical makeup was very much the same. And uh, all we know is that he said that he was using that name and that he was in and around Dallas. And uh, I think probably more importantly, uh, he was traveling across the United States and he had been with the Cuban exiles. And there was reports from Cuban exiles that, hey, we know Oswald. And yet we had no real reports of Oswald himself having uh, real close contact with the Cuban exiles. Did, so. did any of these other Cuban exiles appear in Dallas, or is there any evidence linking specific members of the Cuban exile community that were involved in this anti-Castro activity to the assassination? Well, one of the major connections would have to be one that was brought out probably in about 1976, 75, right before I wrote uh, right after I wrote uh, the major portion of cover-up and it was all ready to press. And that was that a Cuban exile who was involved in attempts to assassinate uh, Fidel Castro said that he was called by his case officer, his CIA contact, to meet him in Dallas at a tall building. And uh, when he arrived for that meeting, this CIA case officer was talking with Lee Oswald. And of course that case officer has never been completely identified, but it's a, it's a good possibility that he would be, uh, you know, a high ranking member of the CIA who was involved in the planning of the, of the assassination apparatus and uh, knew this Oswald well. Now whether this was Harley Oswald, the mm -hmm. one who died on November uh, 24th, 1963, or whether it's this other Oswald. What to, happened to him? To, uh, Tommy Davis, mm -hmm. uh, the second Oswald, as I call him. He was, uh, they found him dead uh -huh. up near Jacksboro, Texas, at an old mining, uh, rock mining place. And uh, allegedly there was no autopsy, so we really don't know mm -hmm. much about it, but he had been dead for many days in hot, humid weather. And uh, he allegedly uh, was uh, stealing copper from this old mine to get some money. That's how far he had gone and cut through a, an electrical wire that electrocuted him. Wow. But again, we don't. We One don't of know. many people involved with this that died of Well, again, and it, and it happens at strategic times. It mm -hmm. happened, you know, as the Senate Select Committee was, had begun to investigate this assassination. Mm -hmm. Uh, of foreign leaders like Fidel Castro mm. and uh, he would have been one that would definitely have been called because of his connections to QJ Wynn. A very um, curious phenomenon has emerged just this last week or two and that is that supposedly the CIA was keeping their eye on the Cuban exile community after the Kennedy assassination because they were afraid that something would be revealed in this community that might get out to the press at uh, large. And a report says that uh, a CIA officer, Mr. George Bush, and I think 1963 gave a report to I think J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI concerning this uh, community, 
which uh, would indicate that the CIA was intensely involved in what the Cubans uh, were up to. And this raises some questions about Mr. George uh, Bush, uh, who is running for uh, President of the United States now, because he had denied previously that he was in the CIA until he was named director of the CIA in 1975. Was this something of a surprise to you? Very when much you're, so. You're doing your research, and what did you make of this? I can't make anything out of it right now, mm -hmm. except I'm going to look into it more and more. Uh, I'm interested in his connection to a man by the name of, of uh, Felix Rodriguez, uh, who uh, is, uh, goes back all the way to the Bay of Pigs, right. you know, which may or may not mean that George Bush goes all the way back to the Bay of Pigs and his involvement with the CIA. Remember, the CIA has employees, and then they have contract agents that are, that are hired for specific uh, tasks and uh, are really not considered on the payroll, right. but are paid contract amount. And uh, so, they also have denying assets, that, right. denying Mr. Bush mm -hmm. denying that he was mm -hmm. ever involved with the CIA uh, prior to 1975 is a little strong, I think, on his part. Right. The other thing they have are <laughs> assets, which are people that work with them right. on specific uh, projects. An article just appeared in the middle of uh, July in the Nation magazine that indicated that George Bush's biography and the stories about him uh, from various uh, reporters are always very sketchy about what he was doing in the early 1960s. He was working with his oil business there that was very active in the Caribbean, and he was traveling a lot in that uh, area, which would make him a perfect CIA asset. That is, someone who would do activities for them, provide information to them once in a while, and have close working relations mm -hmm. with the uh, CIA. Um, the Bush uh, camp has denied, by the way, that uh, he was a member of the CIA at that time and raised the question, was there another Mr. George Bush? <laughs> and this uh, document, it's an FBI document. Uh, the, uh, the names uh, George Bush. Did Tom Davis look like George Bush? No, uh, afraid not. <laughs> but this could be a major embarrassment for Bush, particularly because this Felix Rodriguez that you okay. mentioned uh, be, turns up in the Iran Contra operation mm -hmm. as the man in El Salvador who was in charge of getting supplies to the Contras. And when the congressional funding of this project uh, was ended for a couple of years, Mr. Rodriguez allegedly engaged in some illegal activities to get uh, guns and uh, different supplies to the uh, countries that might even involve drug running. These are the allegations mm -hmm. yeah, they're that, saying are, that, they're that are made. Right. And that George Bush's uh, office was in close contact with Felix Rodriguez at uh, this time. Don Gregg. Uh, who was Bush's uh, deputy director of the CIA when he was head of it in 1975 and who was one of uh, Bush's uh, closest uh, workers in Bush's office was in close contact with Phil Felix Rodriguez in this Contra uh, supply operation that would push Bush very close to some highly illegal um, operations. Mm -hmm. Now, the, if he goes all the way back to the 1960s, connected with this group. This is sensational. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I can say is, is, is I'll guarantee it won't lay dormant. There'll be some people working on, on this between now and election time. There's another new bit of evidence that has come up since our program in 79, and that concerns a Frenchman by the name of Swetra. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's a, an intriguing story and one that we had just started following when I was with you back in the, in the late 1970s. We had gotten hold of a CIA document under the Freedom of Information Act that said that a man by the name of Jean Swetra, a Frenchman, mm -hmm. also known as Michael Mertz, also known as Michael Rue, was uh, in Dallas on the day of the assassination and was expelled from the country within 48 hours of the president's death and that he had previously been involved in attempts on the life of French Premier Charles de Gaulle. Mm. So, of course, immediately the, the antenna goes up on, <laughs> on a document like that. Here's an assassin in Dallas, and nobody's looking at him. So we began to pursue him. Uh, it's been a long trail, and we're still not through, but uh, I can tell you this, that there is actually a Jean Swetra. Our people has talked to him. He's denied that he was in Dallas. 
Uh, and in fact, he's denied that he's been in the United States, and we have no proof that he has. Uh, there is actually a Michael Rue. He was in uh, Texas on the, uh, uh, at the time of the assassination. But the, the man that we became more interested in, in, because I traced down the immigration and naturalization investigator who was given the responsibility of going and picking up that Frenchman in Dallas on the day of the assassination and seeing that he was expelled from the country. And I questioned him about his, you know, the identification and the appearance, the physical description of the man that he arrested. He said it was a man approximately 45 years old, thinning gray hair, uh, about 200 pounds. Well, John Swetra was 35 years old in 1963 and uh, full head of hair and uh, probably not over 180 pounds. Mm. Michael Rue was only 25 years old. So the only man that met the description was with Michael Meritz. And uh, Swetra said, told our people, that uh, Mr. Meritz used his name quite frequently in his travels because what Mr. Meritz did best among other things, was smuggled heroin into the United States. He was a, a killer and uh, known as one all the way back to the time of World War II. He became a member of the French Secret Service, and that's uh, uh, the equivalent of our CIA, STEC. Mm -hmm. And uh, in his connections with that organization, uh, began a drug operation into this country became very, very wealthy. Not only did he do that, he married uh, the, the daughter of the biggest brothel owner in, in Paris, France. Now the CIA, or the OSS at the time, was very instrumental in bringing the uh, French Mafia back and busting heads to keep the communist unions from, uh, and, and the communist party from gaining power in France. And they helped particularly in Marseille to help uh, reestablish the mafia and their drug operations. Now, is this where this fellow was uh, connected? This, fe this fellow here is connected okay. with that same group in Marseille. And how does he connect with that structure that you outlined that might well have been the group that carried out the Kennedy assassination? That does he fit into this scenario? That's what, I'm, that's what I would like to know. I We've see. not been able to contact him. He's highly protected, mm -hmm. uh, lives on a huge a uh, piece of property outside of, uh, of Paris. Uh, he is very, very wealthy and uh, very well protected. You can't get to him. So I'd like to ask him, were you in Dallas? You know, uh, probably if, if I were guessing and because of his background, uh, he was, by the way, involved in infiltrating the OSS. I mean, the OAS, the secret army organization that was trying to kill President de Gaulle. Right. Uh, his modus operandi to infiltrate the OAS was the same one that Oswald used in New Orleans to infiltrate the Pro Castro. Oh, group, or make, make him to think make that him he, think was, he pro was pro OAS. Castro. Right. He mm -hmm. passed out leaflets. Right. So he, in my opinion, is a is a good suspect for the director of the uh, assassination, and he, could possibly be Q. J. Wynn who was a European. He could oh. have, that, that's an interesting hypothesis, he could have also simply allied himself with the American Mafia to help finance the operation that would involve a lot of money and perhaps to provide personnel for the operation. It might be the French and American Mafia got together and had these intelligence agency contacts that they'd worked with and that that was the core organization. Could so this, this could easily be a piece of the puzzle. Right, but we do know that uh, he was considered the protege of a man by the name of Lucien Rivard, who was a French-Canadian out of the uh, Montreal area, who also was in and out of Cuba with Santos Traficati. And uh, so the Cuban connection comes in. So he in. has the Cuban motive as right, well. as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, we've had uh, first the Warren Commission, then we had this most recent uh, congressional investigation and we still are involved in trying to find out what happened. Is it just so complex that it's just impossible to get a handle on, or could it be solved very easily, you think? 
I don't think it's so complex. I think it's just been so mis, uh, mismanaged. It's, uh, the investigation? The investigation. A, a political assassination should never be uh, investigated by mm, political people or in the political arena, in my opinion. If you want to find out who committed the murder, uh, you get investigators and people who are familiar with how to investigate a murder. And you pay them and you go after it. It's my contention that this case is, is solvable and uh, would, could be done within probably six months' time. And how would this really? happen? What would be necessary to carry the investigation to stage further? I think that, uh, number one, it ought to be done in Texas. It ought to be done in Dallas, Texas. We ought to convene a grand jury. We now have a new district attorney in Dallas who was not present uh, at the time of the assassination and show them the evidence, let them c call the people, the witnesses, subpoena the evidence, uh, hire the necessary consultants and, and uh, you know, I'm not patting myself or any other critic on the back when I say this, mm -hmm. but we've spent 25 years looking at this. We know where the evidence is. We know the places to look. And uh, if, if there was a mistake that the House Select Committee made, it was not taking advantage of those 20 years of or research. so of research and experience. Did they call any of the people who... Only at a, a very, you know, small, uh, you know, and, and opportune times. And it was never a give and take. They never took us into confidence where they, if they could tell us something, then we could tell them something. It was never a, a two-way street. And uh, so they lost a great deal, even though we kept on assisting them right up to the end with, with the questions they would ask. We'd give them the best answers. But had they been able to say, well, such and such happened, you know, and this and this says this, uh, we probably could have taken it a step further. Have you been able to get any assistance or cooperation with any government agencies or individuals within them, or do you have to wait until these people retire? I think, uh, no, we've not gotten any. Probably the most uh, helpful has been the FBI in the last few years. Well, that's a change. Uh -huh. In uh, the release of documents. Freedom of Information Act. Freedom of Act. Information oh, Act. They've been uh, forced to do it. Well, they, they're not as much forced to do it now as, as they, uh, they really do seem to go out of the way to cooperate. Mm. They, that's a change. Uh, yeah, it is a big change. The CIA is still a closed door. And uh, they, they won't respond to, to most anything. And uh, I think, you know, basically what must happen is that it has to come from the people again and, and the pressure has to be put on uh, the people in places of responsibility. That can only come by education. And the media too has a responsibility. Obviously as we indicated in the first show, the media was part of the cover-up uh -huh. and it's the media that would focus attention on this to make it a worthwhile issue in terms of putting uh, importance on it. Right. You you, stay, you yeah. talked about in the, uh, the in the first segment of this uh, show about the our assassination archives and research center, and uh, our uh, this our is thrust. the assassination archive and research center in Washington D.C. Right. that you're a founder and a board of director. That's on. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And our uh, thrust is going to be not only the gathering of information and the gathering of files and the filing of of information uh, lawsuits when necessary, but also to see that uh, this is brought to the attention of the American public. It would be great if our group, which is recognized academically uh, as a historical group now, uh, could have prime time television uh, coverage and let us just go on the air or a mini-series, if you want to call it, because you, as you can see by our time together, you can't do it in an hour or two hours, right. mm -hmm. and show the American people the evidence of the conspiracy, of the cover-up, of uh, the potential suspects or the guilty party, and force a, not a, necessarily a new investigation, a grand jury, uh, looking into it, looking at the facts, and then bringing to trial those 
that they feel need to be indicted. So you want to go more through the legal system. You've seen two political investigations Correct. that were cover-ups. Correct. So you no longer think that the federal government has any interest or motivation. It's not no longer. I You're predicted certain. it before. Mm -hmm. I, I said when the, the, the Congressional Committee was organized that it should never be in a... Right. So we shouldn't make this a demand for the Duke if we want to vote for him. That's right. Because mm -hmm. they would just cover it up anyway even if they did another investigation. But you think if we got some legal prosecutions going, that this might unearth the evidence, and if the media took this up and the American people became educated as to what happened, this could finally solve the case. I think it could. I think that we have open-minded, young, vigorous attorneys mm -hmm. now with sharp minds and uh, would have an open mind to it. I'm 50 years old, spent 20, 25 years. We can furnish them with the facts. And uh, they, they're not politically married yet. And uh, I think they could do something. Now, your book cover up, you had to publish that yourself, I understand, because you couldn't find a publisher that would take it. And so there was a kind of limited edition, about 3,000, right. something like that. Mm -hmm. Is there any way anybody can find a copy of that anymore? Every time, we play, every time we play your program, people call say, I want to buy a pub uh, cover-up and I uh, can't find it. Unfortunately, it's out of print and uh, cannot be found except uh, occasionally in a used bookstore or collector bookstores. They're selling collector bookstores now for $35, 30, $35. Uh, hopefully that uh, before too long I'm going to update it. It's 10 years old now or more, 12 years old. Update it and uh, hopefully find a publisher this time. It, it, it's a different mentality now than it was even in 1976 and certainly different from the one in 63. So uh, there's a lot of new evidence and uh, a lot of directions that we can point now and I'd like to see it in print. And that brings us to the end of another Alternative Views. Very glad you could join us. If you'd like to contact Gary Shaw, his address is P.O. Box 722, Cleburne, Texas, 76031. That's P.O. Box 722, Cleburne, Texas, 76031. The organization which Gary Shaw is co-founder and member is Assassination Archives and Research Center in Washington, D.C. The address is 918 F Street, Northwest, Suite 510, and the zip code is 20004. Their phone number is area code 202-393-1917. The Assassination Archives and Research Center is set up to be a repository of all sorts of materials concerning all assassinations. They have thousands of books, and articles, manuscripts, photos, files, tapes. They have a computerized index of 15,000 names and events and uh, FBI and CIA documents. A wonderful organization. We'd like to thank our crew for the program, our director, Brian Lynch, camera people, Joanna Mahalik and Beverly Garrett. Our audio person was Robert Rober. Editing assistance was provided by Anna Quattrochi and Johanna Mahalik. Alternative Views is a presentation of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. So long as you're jotting down all these addresses, you might as well jot down ours. That's Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Goodbye.